All righty. So Python is very popular, used by Google, NASA, the CIA, Disney. Processed at runtime by the interpreter. You don't compile your program before executing it, although when you run it, it does a syntax check. Python is a, it comes with a development environment, pretty prude one. Programming language. It got some editing tools, but it is a programming language. This course covers Python 3.x. It's not hard to change from one version to the other. If you have to go back in time and use version 2, it's pretty similar. And then if you run into syntax errors, then you, uh, you Google them up. The true is not, the, the reverse is not necessarily true. When uh, they implemented Python 3, it broke pretty much all of Python 2 code, so the uptake on it was pretty slow. <clears throat> and even though Python 2 hasn't been, you know, supported and expanded since, you know, the early 2010s, if, if even then, there's a lot of code out there written out. But then again, there's a lot of code written out in, you know, COBOL. Anyways. My wife does COBOL programming, and if she heard me diss COBOL, I'd be in trouble. All right. Python 1.7 is the most widely... No. Python code must be compiled. Nah. C Python is an implementation of Python. Yeah. And I'm sure that was on the last slide. And honestly, I don't remember other implementations of Python other than C Python. C Python is the one that we use, as far as I know, which means, you know, written in the C language. Let's look up what C Python really is. C Python is the reference implementation, meaning that it's the, sta the gold standard of the Python programming language written in C and in Python. It's the default most widely used implementation. Yeah, it makes you wonder what the other versions are. Makes me wonder anyways. And you're going, I already do online quizzes. Well, this, this one's better in terms of learning syntax, I believe. Your first program. Let's start off by creating a short program. Write one that displays hello world. In Python, we use the print statement. Try it yourself. All righty. Looking good. I bet it's going to work. Run. Hello world. All right, I'm feeling pretty good about this. Congratulations, you are now a programmer. Okay, next line. Fill in the blanks to print hi. Yeah. Correct. The print statement can also print out multiple lines of text. We've talked about this. Try it yourself. Run. All right. Look back over here. Fill in the blank. Okay, this is somewhat teasy. Uh, not teasy. Somewhat easy. Print. But then we're going to have to have a closing parentheses or it's a syntax error. My guess is the majority of y'all aren't following along. And that's okay. But we get to some good stuff later. I wish we could jump ahead. You know what? Maybe I ought to create an account that we could all use. And then we could all just jump ahead to where I want us to do. But anyways. You can take a shortcut quiz. You saw a shortcut? How do you do that? Where is that? Uh, you go back to the screen where it shows the, the bubbles. Or the different time. Yeah, you can take a shortcut quiz. All righty. Yeah, we'll test out of some of this stuff. Okay, cool. Yeah, so do that, guys. Thank you. You done uh, solo learn before, or did you just spot that? I did it in my uh, uh, fundamentals class. Donna, yeah. Donna Wilson. Okay, so this is a re rehash for some of y'all. Sorry about that. How many lines will this code print? While false, print looping. Somebody tell me that's a while loop, but the condition is false, so it's not going to print any. Just like if that was an if statement. Not that we've talked a lot about while loops, so I'm pretty sure that y'all hit the idea in fundamentals. What is the output of this code? We're starting at zero. For i in range is going to 
since we're passing in a 4, that's going to count 0, 1, 2, and 3. So 0 plus 1 is 2, plus 2 is 4, plus 3 is 7. Hope I got that right. Did I do wrong? Well, I failed. Lives, too. What does the output of this go? Anyways, anyways. You might get some good stuff. Especially if you got here without taking Python in fundamentals, which is quite possible. It was, fundamentals was taught in other languages or no programming language at all in the past here. Recently, past couple of years, everybody standardized on Python. And since it's not a prereq, you may not have taken it at all. So, I'm going to recommend you go to Solo Learn and tab your way through it if you have not had exposure to the language in the past. I'm not going to make it worth a grade. But you could probably learn four times as quickly as we are learning in the textbook, or at least you can catch up really quickly. And I would like to be going more quickly through the textbook, but we've missed a day, I believe. And let's uh, go to the PowerPoint. All right, we already have this idea. We've talked about this. What is a variable? A variable's got several components. It's got four components. Have I mentioned those components? Can anybody name them? Any of them? Variables have what? They've got a name. They've got a value. What else do they have? Some of y'all took my fundamentals class. I want to hear an answer. Did I not... I mean, it's quite possible that since I didn't. Yeah, a type and a memory address. Exactly. We don't care about the memory address in this language. In some languages like C and C++, it's very important. I'm just going to type my notes directly into a So variable. Four components. <clears throat> First three are of critical importance, so I'm going to flag them with stars. They got a name. Right, if you don't know the name, you can't access it. They got a type. The type dictates how it can be used. They have a value, and they have a memory address. Maybe I'll flag these with two stars, <clears throat> even three. These are the ones we really care about. <clears throat> Python completely manages that, and there's no way to get it to tell you what the memory address is, as far as I know. Languages that let you access memory addresses directly you can do some really cool programming with it, but it's like being on a motorcycle rather than on a tank, right? Uh, you, know, you can fall off your motorcycle a lot more easily than you can a tank. It's far more risky. Okay, so what does type mean? Type dictates two things. Three things, really, but I'm going to skip the other one. I'm going to skip the first one. I'm going to mention it, but... The type dictates how it's stored inside computer's memory. We don't care how it's stored inside the computer's memory for the most part. We don't care if a list is stored, you know, top down, back up, you know, randomly, you know, that, that's transparent to us. It, type dictates what kind of data the variable can hold and what operations can be done on that data. Did we do a turtle program? No turtle? All right. All right. Let's play with a turtle really, really, really fast. I'm going to close my notes here. If you're not taking the notes, that's okay. But you might want to play along with this. To get the turtle going, Import turtle. That brings in the turtle library. And then get the case of this next statement absolutely correctly and end it with parentheses. T is equal to turtle, all lowercase, dot, and then the next letter is capitalized. Turtle with a capital T, parentheses in parentheses. Now we're going to set the speed of the turtle to pretty fast. So t.speed, parentheses, 10. 
which is max speed unless you set it to warp speed, which is zero. Goes from one, which is agonizingly slow, to ten. All right. Now, we're going to write a little loop. We're going to draw like four turtles. Uh, excuse me, four circles. So, four, x in range, parentheses four. For x in range, parentheses four, end parentheses, colon. What this does, reminder, is this counts 0, 1, 2, and 3. Why? Because it, range statement always starts counting at 0, unless you tell it otherwise. And it always goes out, but does not meet this one. If you've done programming with four statements before, you might imagine it's going to go 1, 2, 3, 4. And then once you get the idea that it's going to start at 0, you might think that it's going to go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Instead, this is one past the stopping point. All right. And now we're going to do t dot circle. Draw me a circle, and I want it to have a radius of 20 pixels. All right. Then t dot you can type out the whole word forward, but people tend to leave off the R, so I'm going to abbreviate it t.fd. They gave the uh, function two names. We're going to go forward 20 pixels, and we're going to do the same thing again. In fact, just copy and paste this stuff. So t.fd, parentheses 20, in parentheses, and then repeat that. Then save your work and run it. Of course, I'm coming over here to sneak a peek at what assignment we're on, E. All right, just in case you need to load earlier, you know, you don't want to wait for me to do it at the end of class. If I create it earlier in the class, it makes it easier. I need to remember to do that every time. All right, so this is lecture E. Now when I run it, we're going to see what the turtle does. And I forgot to do something stupid. I mean, I, anyways, you get the idea, right? What I actually meant to do is to turn it 90 degrees each time. But you saw what it's doing. We could fix that while we're sitting here and looking at it. After you draw a circle, turn 90 degrees. T dot right, 90. And after this one, let's make a turn left each time, just to be novel. T dot left, 90. I'll read the code back, sorry. All right, cool. We've drawn something. The type of this variable is turtle. This creates a turtle object. Ob the object is turtle is the class, which is the type. Not that we've done a lot of object-oriented programming, but just like you can have a string and a float and an int, you can have a turtle class. That dictates the kind of data it is. And we don't know internally how that data is stored. We can make some guesses based on its output about some of the things that it contains. It has to have an x and a y coordinate, right? Or else it wouldn't remember where it was. It has to have a what angle it's currently at. And although you didn't see examples of it, it has to have, you know, a color. And since it can fill, not that we've done that, but you can draw a circle and fill it. It has to have a fill state. You can make it to where the pin is not drawing anything as it moves. So it has to have a pin up and a pin down state. Right, so there are a lot of, there's a pin thickness. There's a pin speed. So if I change that to zero, it's going to be darn near instantaneous. So you get the idea. These are all... That's the data that's behind the scenes. We don't know what that data is, but we know how to interact with it. We know that we can set its speed like that. That's an operation. 
we know that we can call a circle and it will draw a circle. We know that we can turn right and it will set the new heading, you know, 90 degrees to the right. Weird thing about turtles is, uh, come on, get back over there, that when you run it, it starts off going to the right rather than up. As far as turtles are concerned, straight to the right is like due north, right? It's zero degrees. And so that's 90 degrees, and this is 180 degrees, and that's 270 degrees. And, uh, you know, I've had, like, pilots in here, and they just really, really, really hated the fact that zero degrees was going, you know, do right, but whatever. By the way, gang, do not call your file turtle.py. If you name your file turtle.py, you break it. This is a good reason, a good example of why you do not save in the guts of the Python directory, in that Python 32 or Python 64 or whatever directory that it, that it uh, defaults to. And the reason why is eventually you will pick a file name that uh, overrides the function of an existing library. Like if you, call, if you save something called math.py in the wrong place, then Python won't even load. I believe that's the case. And then you have to wipe out your entire Python subdirectory and reinstall it if you can't find the offending, you know, the offending file that you saved. So the point of that exercise is that we had a variable named T. It had a type. It had a value. We don't know what those values are. Somewhere all that data was being saved. And type dictates what kind of data it is, right? The X, Y position and the color of the pen and, the, you know, the direction and speed and all that. And what operations can be done. Turtle is not a math variable. If we did this, T plus equals 10, that's probably going to be a syntax error. Yeah, unsupported operand type. Cannot do a plus equals. Cannot add an int to a turtle. Yeah, okay. Just like... If you have a string, t is equal to, you know, bob divided by, I really apologize for that. Do y'all get the twice daily calls about people tell, um, telling you that your car warranty has expired? Anybody get the one that's saying that you have an IRX tax debt due and that you need to call this number that's probably out of the uh, out of the nation in order to resolve that one? I don't really uh, answer calls that aren't in my contact list. Right. Because they're always spam. Right. I get the one that's nobody right. talks to me anyway. Yeah. The I get the one that's a recorded message of, you have four serious charges levied against you, warrants will be issued in your county, and the cops will visit your place of work. Yeah, that that's fun. It's really hilarious when they say the cops will be, will visit you at your place of work. First off, they're never going to warn you. Second of all, they're not going to say cops. They're going to say police. Yeah, the cops are going to. And people actually fall for it because they're stupid. Right. Here come the pigs. Right. You know, no, <laughs> they're not going to use that kind of language. You're right. Okay, so I've gotten the call about the tax warning. Right. You're two thousand dollars overdue. Call the IRS. At, and I felt like calling them and giving them completely bogus information. <laughs> Right, you know, here's my name, here's my social security number, okay, here's my credit card. Man, I don't know why it's not working, but but that would probably put my phone number on some high priority spam list and I get 20 calls a day, so I don't. The only reason I need to answer the calls that aren't on my contact list is because, you know, students may, and other teachers, I may not have them in my contact list. Okay, so anyways, can you take a string and divide it by 10? No, you cannot. That's going to be an error. Not a syntax error. It's a runtime error because it doesn't know how to divide a string by an int. You can multiply a string by an int. Well, I think I've demonstrated this. It's kind of weird, but by the time we're done and we print it out, it's going to be bop, 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 you know, ten times in a row. It's the only language I've ever seen that does that. Bop, 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 bop. Okay. <laughs> And that's kind of nice for one reason and one reason only as far as I'm concerned. If you do 10 or 80 times an underscore, end quote, it's going to print like a nice little line. Well, you know, like that. Okay, well, it went on to the next line, but you get the idea. I like that. Quick way to draw lines on your...
Names are case sensitive. Weight is different from weight. They cannot begin with a digit. So 1989 tax rate is an illegal variable name, whereas tax rate 1989 is not. You can't put a space in the variable name because it thinks that it's two commands in the language. Right, if I do my name equals mud, because I'm a Primus fan, here we go. There we go. It blows up because it thinks that these are two different things and it doesn't know what to do about it. So you can't do that. Underscores are acceptable. I believe underscores are the only special symbol that you can use. And by special symbol, I mean non-alphanumeric. And as you can guess, alpha numeric means letters and digits. So underscores work great. Minus signs, though, it wants to treat as a subtraction. Dollar sign. Some languages support dollar sign as a variable name. Let's find out if Python does. Nah, it doesn't know what a dollar sign is. And I just closed my code. All right. So, names. Whoops. Triple quotes. Names can be alphanumeric. Cannot start with a digit. Can have underscores. No spaces. Kind of your four rules. So typically, programmers use <clears throat> all uppercase variables to mean a constant, something the program never changes. Now, Python doesn't actually support the ability to lock down a variable and make it a true constant. Right. Um, in C, C++, I could type this. Const int i is equal to 4. That would lock down i so that I could never change i midway through the program. I could not say i plus equals 1 or i is equal to 10 or something like that. It would count as a syntax error. The compiler would catch it. This language, and in Java, it's the word final instead of const. They had to be different. In this one, there is no way of doing it. And of course, you don't even define its type and you don't use a semicolon, but whatever. So, all caps is used to indicate constants so-called constants, values that the program should not change, right? If you figure out that, uh, you know, if you're calculating the, uh, the mass of a certain amount of oxygen, the uh, atomic, the molecular weight of oxygen should not change halfway through your program. So you probably would not want that to work. And so you might do, this is a stupid variable name, molecular weight of O, right? <laughs> Or it should be an atomic weight because the molecular weight would be twice as much. What have I done there? Where did lecture heat go? Did I accidentally delete everything? Or did I? Okay. Anyways, okay. So like that. And it's actually not 32. It's, uh, you know, if you've taken chemistry classes, you know that the molecular... Yeah. Anyways, I don't know what the molecular weight of oxygen is. But you get the idea. This is something that probably the program should not change. Now, honestly, if I saw a variable name that was all lowercase that said molecular weight of O2, I wouldn't change it anyways, right? But say that I had some hard limit in my program, like the maximum number of scores that I could store in my program, right? My program was supposed to store 100 test scores. Say that my code depended upon this and it would break if later on that number was changed. So if I had 100 lines of code, blah, 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 and then later on I saw, you know, okay, I'm gonna change this because I wanted to print out a number of, uh, different number of maximum scores. It's possible that I coded it in such a way that that would break the program. I should have known, gentlemen and gentlewoman's agreement, that since I typed this all in caps, that I should not be changing that variable. Quite often what people do is they define their constants up at the very top of the program. I could come up here and, you know, maybe underneath my comment block, you know, my name, you know, and this is CIT1203, whatever, you know, February 12, 
to 1 9. But anyways, I can define my constants, right? C being the speed of light is equal to, I don't know what it is, 3.0 times e to the 9 or whatever. I'm not going to make that up. Avogadro's number is equal to 6.022 exponent of 23. Right, and I'm not supposed to change that. If I'd made that lowercase, then I might have been prone to accidentally using it for something else, like the average rather than Avogadro's number. So that's what you use that for. Enough about that. Not that. that. The assignment state, uh, statement. A single equal copies a value. A double equal compares a value. So E, excuse me, equal, single equal is the assignment operator. X equals 3. Double equals is the equality operator. It tests it if X equals equals 3. Quite common, and I'll do it up here, I'm sure. You leave off the double equal, it's a syntax error. In some languages, it's not even a syntax error. In some languages, it overwrites x with 3, right? Destroys your data. Uh, maybe you did not want it to destroy your data in an if statement. That's like saying, if, you are hung, uh, if your house is blue, and while I'm asking that, I'm painting it blue, right? Stupid. Fortunately, this language does not support that. It just flags it as a syntax error. I hate that the icons for both of these is red. You go over there. All right. So variables serve two purposes. Keep track of data. It changes over time. Or maybe not even change over time, right? Like constants. Help the programmer to refer to a complex piece of information with a simple name. Abstraction. That turtle is a whole bunch of information. It's x-coordinates, it's y-coordinates, the angle it's going to, etc. That's a bunch of information, but it has been abstracted, right? We don't know all of that. We don't need to know all the details. We just need to know how to use it. If we were writing a program, you know, that controlled a motor, we would know that we could set the speed of the motor, you know, we could stop the motor, you know, we could, I don't know, all the things, you know, that you can do to it. But uh, all of that would be stored behind the scenes. And we wouldn't really care how that information was saved, whether it was saved in the motor itself or in the program. You'll hear about the virus that was uh, sent to the Iranians a couple of years back that uh, caused these centrifuges for separating uranium, processing yeah. uranium. Yeah. Yep, sucks in it. And uh, what it would do is it would cause the centrifuges to behave just a little off. But enough off, you know, it said, that, you know, it was rotating 10,000 times, you know, per minute or whatever, and it was really rotating, you know, 11,000 times per minute or whatever, and it would damage the, the centrifuges, and they would have no idea why. So, you know, I have no idea why I mentioned that, but y'all are, you know, half of y'all are in the sec security, so I'm sure that you've heard of that one. And then uh, the source code for that one, or, the, you know, the fact that the virus exists, you know, leaked because of uh, eventually somebody caught it and then people could disassemble it and figure out how it worked and so then other you know operators besides our government perhaps the Israeli government you know have adopted it for their own nefarious ends and that's one problem with creating these you know these offensive cyber aggressive tools is that once they leak out into the wild other people start using them too doc strings A doc string, a multiple line string of the form. Three quotes. Program, author, last modified, the purpose of this program is whatever. Documents it. Now a program comment is something that the computer ignores. Now doc strings you can use under specific circumstances to, assert, uh, to achieve specific goals. Notice I'm being incredibly vague. If we hit further examples of it, then I'll mention them. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't remember. Okay, end-of-line comments. An end-of-line comment is when you begin something with a hash, whereas a multi-line comment is the quote, quote, quote. Tips related to comments and doc strings. 
Begin a program with a statement of purpose. I am going to rule the world. No. Um, instead, something like what this program does. Accompany a variable definition with a comment that explains the variable's purpose. Up here, where I declared the molecular weight of O2, I might want to list in what units it is. AMU, or atomic mass units. Something that would, you know, make sense to another, you know, another programmer. Maximum scores. Do not change this. Okay, if I saw that in a, uh, a comment, then uh, I would be offended because <laughs> I'd be annoyed that somebody wrote it in such a way that I could not change that and still have the program to work. But it's possible you'll run into code like that. It's possible you'll do it. You're, you're right. You're in a hurry to get it done. Something like that. You can put warnings in your code, right, about why the program needs to... Don't change this chunk of code without serious forethought, right? If you write some code and it's, it's risky for someone else to change... You know, you kind of had to hack it together to, you know, to get it to work. You're relying on some odd feature of the language, whatever. You can document that. Uh, otherwise, right, uh, you know, you just put comments like fn equals empty string. You know, you could say first name, right? lp equals empty quote, login password. Am I recommending that you use two-letter variable names? No, and I've already explained why I use shorter variable names in class and I recommend you all use it in your own code. The uh, only exceptions being counters, right? For x equals 1 to 10 or, you know, something like that. Why not use x rather than the whole word counter? Precede major segments of code with brief statements that explain their purpose. Right. I could write comments, you know, open the file, determine the number of lines, and store that as a list, right? So I could put that as kind of a little block above the code, and, you know, and then there'd be 10 lines of code underneath that. And then later on, I could explain, you know, what we were going to do with that data. Display data on screen, allow the user to edit it, right? And then, you know, 10 more lines of code that would accomplish that, just like chapter headers. The first applications of computers were to crunch numbers. I would argue that there were two purposes of the first applications of computers. The Americans used them to crunch numbers in order to, uh, you know, calculate weapons tables and, you know, adjust bomb sites and stuff like that, while the English used them to crack codes, which are kind of numbers, but also ultimately text. The use of numbers in many applications is still important. So you have integers, which are whole numbers. Python holds huge integers, larger than some languages. A number up to 31, right? 10 to 21 to the power of 31. That's a large number. I don't really know what it is. Something's off about that. Why can it hold larger negative numbers than positive numbers? I'm not going to do the diversion to figure that out. Integer literals are written without commas. Right, you don't say x equals one comma zero 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 to indicate that it's one thousand. Real numbers have infinite precision. We don't have infinite precision in uh, in a programming language. Right, you can't say x is equal to and then have you know infinity of digits like pi, right, or even one over three is supposed to be point three 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 repeating endlessly, right. Well, instead, we use a floating point type to represent real numbers as closely as possible within reasonable limits. Now, this one does happen to match it, um, the data, the range of, of floating point numbers in other programming languages, which is like a 1 followed by 308 zeros. Right? Typical precision is 16 digits. 16 digits indicates... The precision, what does that mean? It means that if I wanted to represent some number that looked like this, internally did a computer, and this is a half truth, but let's let's roll with it. How many zeros do we have here? Too many, but 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. 
Let's pretend that that's 40. I don't really know what it is. So it would store out to a precision of 16 characters. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And then exponent, you know, I, I said we're going to pretend it was 40. There. So if I did this, x is equal to that, it winds up being stored like this. We've lost all the rest of the precision. Now, honestly, that's a pretty precise number. If you're controlling, a, you know, a, uh, a probe that's uh, flying out to Pluto where, you know, a mere millionth or billionth of, you know, a degree difference might cause it to miss a planet completely, then you might need to figure out some other way of doing that. Of course, a space probe probably would not be written in Python. But still, in most languages, I mean, in all languages, there are limits to the precision of the floating point data types. And if you need to exceed that, you have to use some specialized class, of which, you know, I bet Python has them, and I don't know what it is. Just wanted to introduce you to the idea of precision. Another thing that is worth mentioning is that behind the scenes this number is stored in binary. Not just in binary, but in powers of 2 rather than in powers of 10, which can introduce rounding errors. It sounds weird, but uh, if you have some specific number like that, it's possible that that could not be expressed precisely in a power of 2. It would approximate it as close as it could but it would not be able to do so you know, precisely. And that's called a floating point error. You know, the, uh, the limits of the data is that this has to be stored as a power of two. Now that is not a must. There is a data type that was used in old fashioned computers called BCD, which stood for binary coded decimal, where if you type this in, each one of these is stored as a decimal number rather than as power of two in, the, in some kind of binary counting system. And why is that useful? It's because you don't get any rounding errors. What you see on the screen is exactly what is saved in the computer's memory. So why don't we use that? Because uh, binary operations are, you know, thousands of times faster than BCD operations. So... I want to see if I, I always do this and I never find one. I find it for other language, but example of Python floating point error, rounding error. Come on, give me a quick example. I need to research that one in advance. Usually you can do some trick where you do something like divide. I'm going to take a shot at it. I'm going to take a shot at it, see if I get it right. Might not. A is equal to 1 divided by 19. B is equal to 2 divided by 19. Print A, print B, now print A minus B minus B, ought to be zero. No, I have that wrong. It should be B minus A minus A, right, because this is two. Okay, let's see. Print B minus A minus A. And if it comes out zero, great. My suspicion is that there's some kind of floating point rounding error, but maybe it's more than 16 digits of precision out there. I ought to be able to find an example where you could do that and it would be 0. 0.000, you know, and then after a certain number of places, it would not be all zeros. And the very, very first IBM um, PCs, you know, sold in like 1980, 81 or whatever, had very blatant rounding errors to where if you did 4 minus 4 and then you printed the result, it would say 0. 0.00000, you know, 192, which is absurd. But, and then worse is when that bug got accidentally coded into the Pyth um, the, in some Intel chips. And so you'd install it in your computer. Back in the days when you had to actually install a separate chip to do math, a floating point coprocessor, and then it's doing math wrong, not a good deal.
Floating point numbers can be stored in ordinary decimal notation, like 0 0.00378, or they can be expressed in exponent form. And if that, with that E, that's a shortcut for this form. You're probably already familiar with that. You, you've used a scientific calculator that can store data in exponent notation. This does not mean 3.78 to the power of 3, right? It doesn't mean 3.78 cubed. Instead, it means 3.78 multiplied by 10 to the negative 3, which moves the decimal over 3 times. And we can see that. 3 point, here's the decimal. So it started off there. 1, 2, 3, and that's its final resting place. And if it was to the positive 3, it would go the other way, right? So 3 to the positive 3 there means 3.78 times 10 to the power of 3, which is 1,000. And so it would wind up the decimal point would go 1, 2, 3. So it would look like that when it was done. There's the ASCII coding standard, which is how strings are stored in your computer's memory. Like if I go to TextPad and I type in bad dad, like that, and then I save this. And you might feel like doing this. This is kind of interesting. Then you go to a site called Hex Edit, but now you're kind of abbreviated at Hex, H E X E D dot I T, Hex Edit. We can open that file, we can load that file. So I'm going to go to my, where did I wind up saving that? I guess I didn't save it there. Come on. Okay, I'm going to pick a different file. Attendance.txt. Right, so. Except that was saved as Unicode. Let me find it a uh, different file. I'm just going to open a programming file. Lecture C. So we see here some text. Plain text just created with Notepad or, you know, with idle or something like that. Here's what the text looks like, and here's how it's saved on the disk. Well, how do they come up with these numbers? How is a J equal to a 6A, and an E equal to a 6.5, and an F is one more than a E, so it's 66, 66. And if I change this stuff and save it, I would find out, you know, that the file has been changed in such a, in some way. So, I'm curious if I could capitalize my name. I would need to find out the ASCII value in hex. These may be alien terms, but we're just seeing that these are, you know, are numeric representations of these letters. So I could go to ASCIItable.com, not ASCII, <laughs> ASCII table. Oh, come on. And I could find out that a capital J, not that you can see this, is equal to a hexadecimal 4a. I could go back to the hexadecimal table, I mean the uh, hex editor, and we see a 6a is a lowercase j. That kind of makes me think that since uh, if I change that to a 4a, it's going to make that an uppercase. No, I typed 4-1. 4a, that made it uppercase. And that makes me think that if I subtracted a hexadecimal 20 from each one of these, I can make them all uppercase, right? So 65. 45, 66, 46, 66, 46. Now, if I save this and I open it in idle or notepad, I would see that my comments were now in uppercase rather than lowercase. All of that is dictated by this thing that was invented in the 60s. Before that, there was no standard. You know, you could buy one brand computer and the text would be stored one way. And then you could take that same data and you would try to read it into another computer, and their texts have been stored in a different way, and uh, you wouldn't be able to read it at all, right? The and when I say you, the computer would not be able to understand it. 
they'd have to write some kind of translation program. And maybe that sounds silly, but it's, it's the honest to goodness truth. IBM computers used a completely different standard that was invented before ASCII, and they kept using it for a long time afterward, called EBCDIC, E-B-C-D-I-C, -E -C, um, something like that. And the system was completely different, and to the guy, people who learned ASCII, it seemed completely stupid because there were gaps. You know, you might have A through, you know, L, you know, representing the numbers, you know, 65 through 76. And then instead of 77 being an M, you know, it might jump, you know. So instead of 76, this might be a 96. Why did it jump from there to there? Well, just because that's how IBM did it. IBM computers now, pretty much, as far as I know, not just the desktop computers, right, with the, you know, all of them, have all adopted ASCII. But you had to have some system for saving the text in memory. Well, the same is true in Python. Right, when I did this in my program over here, When I just said T is equal to Bob, it had to save this in memory. And so that's a 66. Well, if it was uppercase, that would be 66. I'm going to change this to values that I happen to know. Inside memory, that is saved as a 66, a 65, and what's two more than a B to get to D? 66, 68 like that. And then if I have a space, like bad dad, then a space is represented as a 20 in memory. And then a D, if I looked it up on that chart, would be a 68. And an A is a 65. I just happen to have that one memorized. And so another D is a 68. Okay, so you don't care about this stuff. You don't care about how these are saved behind the scenes. But you could write something called a Caesar cipher. And the Caesar cipher was when, you know, you wanted to send a message to your, you know, your, your Roman generals, but you did not want the messenger to be able to, you know, be kidnapped, captured en route, and the message interpreted because it would be disastrous if the enemy knew what you were about to do. So you needed to come up with some way of encrypting your data, you know, even back in the, you know, B.C. times and stuff like that. Well, the way that was done was to shift the values to some level. So if I had some message like, you know, attack at dawn, and then you shifted them all up by two, right? A becomes a C, or S-T-U-V, you know, and A becomes a C, and a C becomes an E, J-K-L-M, right? Like that, and an A becomes a C, and a T becomes a V, and you know, I don't know if I'm doing these right, D-E-F, C, whatever W is, is pretty close, W-X-Y, you know, an N, L, M, N, O, P, right? You would send a message like that. And, you know, the bad guys would have no idea what they meant. Now, of course, the NSA would be able to uh, see through that, like, you know, in point one, one you know, a nanosecond or whatever, because it's an incredibly easy cipher to break. You just have to run it several times, you know. Anyways, but you can get the idea. You need to know, though, how much it was shifted by, right? And I don't know if they wrote a 2 on the top of the scroll, you know, or what, to indicate that the letters were shifted by 2. But that's the idea behind Caesar's cipher. Well, what if we wanted to write a program that did Caesar's cipher? We could do that, but we have to know what the value of C is, so that we, or A is, so that we could add 2 to it. I'm going to come down here and play with that. So I have these comments way down here at the bottom. I'm going to close my comments. I'm going to write a message, but I'm really not going to put much in it. It's just going to be an A. How do I increase that to be a C? Here's what I cannot do. I cannot just say, okay, I have an A there. I want to increase it by 2. No, that won't work. You have to get what's known as the ordinal value, otherwise known as the ASCII value, out. To do that, you use the ordinal function. I'm just going to call it val. Val is equal to ORD MSG. If I print out val at this point, it's going to print out 65.
and indeed it did. But then we could take val and we could increase it by 2. Val plus equals 2. Now we have to convert it back to a character. Let's see if I remember how to do that. Message 2 equals chr of the value. And print out, print message 2, msg2. Hopefully it'll print out a C. Yeah. So we took that A, we converted it to its ordinal value, value that it saved to, uh, you know, in computer memory in the disk as. We added 2 to it, shifting it from an A to a C. We created a new character. This is a data type that, we, you know, this is just like INT and float, except it's a character, just another data type. And actually what happens is it gets stored as a string. If we print out the type of MSG2, it would be saved as a string. Now we could do that for each character in a message. We could make a longer message, attack at dawn. We could pull out every character in turn, adding two to every character in turn, and there's nothing magic about two, right? You could, you know, add 10 to it or whatever. The only complicating thing is what happens when you get to Z? It's got to wrap back around, right? So um, you would need to know. It suddenly occurs to me that the way those really work is they wrote a strip of parchment that was wrapped around a stick. No, I think that's a different one. But then if you did not have the exact diameter of the stick, you know, and you wrap that, that uh, strip around it trying to read it, the text, then, then it would not work. But that's not a Caesar cipher. That, that's a different one. All righty. So that's what ordinal, O-R-D, gets the ordinal, parentheses, ASCII, value of a character. CHR converts the ordinal value to a character. As we plunge onward, I need to figure out what kind of homework I'm going to need to create from this. I don't see any homework based on the notes we've taken so far. So then there are literals. A literal is a number that's just literally typed into the program. Two. Nothing is going to change that two unless I come in and literally edit the text of the program. Right? Nothing is going to change that value of 2 except if I change the program source code. I don't know where the term literal came from. It's also known as an unnamed constant. You know, up here when we said molecular weight is equal to blah, 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 that's got a name, right? That's a named constant. This is an unnamed constant. So is that. So, literal equals what's known as an unnamed constant equals a value a number or string I'm going to use the word hard-coded hard-coded into the program I'm sure they use a considerably different terminology I'm giving you some slang why is that hard-coded that means that you got to go in and edit it and what if that program had been written out to silicon, right? You know, into your computer's, you know, ROM or something like that. Then it'd be a real drag, right? Yeah, it would not. You could not go in and change, you know, the silicon to have to have that changed. So hard coding values can be a bad thing because what if the uh, they need to be changed, right? Midwest City tax rate. You hard coded a 7.25 or whatever it is, and then a year later. City Council changes the tax rate. Well, then your program is obsolete. Somebody would have to go in and change it by hand. But if you had that tax rate hard-coded throughout the program, hundreds of times you use that, that number, 7.25,
then you'd have to go in and change it. You know, yeah, you could just do a search and replace, right? Control H and change it. But what if you were using the value of pi out to, you know, seven decimals and you thought that pi was equal to three, don't type this, you know, one, five, nine, that, that's not really it. And then one time later, you made a mistake, right? Right, just a typo. So in 30 different places in your code, you repeated that number and all your calculations of the volume of spheres and stuff like that because the volume of spheres is incredibly important. Then you accidentally use that number in the calculation instead. That'd be bad. It would, rep it would insert an error into it that you might not ever spot. And if you did ever spot it, it would take a considerable amount of debugging time to figure out where it was wrong. However, if you defined in your program that pi was equal to that, and then you use that forever after, right, area is equal to, you know, pi r squared. So, you know, pi times whatever the radius is, 10 to the power of 2, whatever. If you ever needed it to be more accurate, you could go in and just change the value of that literal, assigning it to a constant. You would just have it in one place. So you don't want to hard code your numbers, usually, right? Doing this not good, especially if that value is going to be repeated. Now, we've seen the value of pi to recognize that. We know what that means. But what if we had some other constant? I don't really know that many mathematical constants, but whatever Planck's constant is. What, what if we were trying to figure out the wavelength of something, you know, and W is equal to, and, and there was some other, you know, um, I don't know e to the negative, you know, 50, whatever. And I had a whole bunch of calculations based on that value, you know. It's a lot better if I store that in a constant, right? Planks equals, or maybe it's a C, I don't recall. But anyways, and there we go, right? Now the code starts to make a little bit more sense, right? We know that that's Planck's constant, which has got a letter abbreviation. But if I just use a single letter abbreviation like the physics people would, then when I was reading the code, I might not be able to, I might not grasp immediately what it is. And if I got Planck's constant wrong, I could fix it in one place, right? Rather than fixing it in the 17,000 different places in my code that uh, I may have used it. I believe we've talked about these. Minus, that means subtraction. Star stars, exponent. Single stars, multiplication. Double star. M uh, most people call that floor division. I'm sorry that this textbook calls it quotient. I haven't seen any other uh, Python textbook that did that. But we have talked about it, right? We know what star slash slash does. It just rounds down. We know what modulus does. Yes. Like 5 modulus 2, what is that equal to? It's equal to 1 because 2 goes into 5 a certain number of times, but after it did so, there was a remainder, right? It did not go in cleanly, and that remainder was 1. 6 modulus 2, the 2 goes into 6, three times with no remainder, so 6 modulus 2 is 0. So precedence rules. You may remember PEMDAS stands for parentheses. I better put these in our notes. And this is uh, basic math. And you're, you're sure you already know them, but you may not remember them in Specifically, PIM dash stands for parentheses, exponent, and then multiplication and division, which have the same priority, and addition and subtraction, which have the same priority. I should be using the term precedence. That's what the textbook calls them. So if you have this expression, A is equal to 3.6 plus 4 times 5. That does not mean, I'm going to change it. I'm going to get rid of the. Here's not what it means. Does not mean 3 plus 4 is 7 times 5. Instead, it means 3 plus 20. 
That makes sense? Just like if there were parentheses around this. But there's no need for parentheses around this because that multiplication and division have the same priority, same precedent. Now, the fact that multiplication is written before division does not mean that you go through the expression looking for all the multiplications first. If you had this, a is equal to 10 divided by 1 times 5. Let's make it 20 divided by 2 times 5. This does not mean, oh, I better do all the multiplications first because m was before d. So it does not mean 20 divided by 10. Instead, it means, excuse me, I botched that. No, I did not. If I thought that multiplications happened first, I might think that it meant 20 divided by 10, but instead you just do them left to right because they're in the same precedence level. So you do 20 divided by 2, which is 10, times 5. Completely different answers. If you ever have any question about it, you don't have to become an expert at precedence, although the rules are not that hard. If you really wanted it to be like this, you just put parentheses around that part. Force it, because parentheses get done before anything else. Or what if the equation does make sense, but you think that it's hard to read? You can use parentheses to group it together to make it easier to read, even if it does not change the order in which it's done. Just like you've seen me do code like this. Um, if 1 is equal to, you know, a is equal to 10, You've seen me do that. The parentheses are unnecessary in this language. I could rewrite that as this. Maybe I think that in this expression, the parentheses make it easier to read. So you can always throw expressions in, excuse me, parentheses into an expression. It just means evaluate that first before anything else. Now, this is not a really good example because that's not pure assignment math, but you get the idea. So use parentheses to group parts of the expression together. Either to change the precedence, the order of evaluation, or just to make it clear. Don't you hate the phrase, needless to say? If it was needless to say, why are you saying it? But, needless to say, in this language, a is equal to 10 parentheses 2 does not mean a is equal to 10 times 2. You have to put the star there. Also, a is equal to 2b error. You have to put the star there. Why does that matter? Because if I Google up the volume of a cone, it's equal to pi r 2 h over 3. This is not going to work very well. Okay. But what if I took that, I started trying to encode it, and I happen to know that pi, you know, like that. This is not going to work. So if I asked you to change that formula into an expression, you better put the stars between the variable names. If the expression is supposed to be A is equal to, you know, 2BC, you better put the asterisks. This should instead be V is equal to pi times R times 2 divided by H to the power of 3. Right. Got to do that. A is equal to 2 times B 
try and see. Give me for a moment. All right, so homework. Write a program that will calculate the perimeter, the diagonal, and the area of an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper in inches. Then also do the same. What's a legal size? What are the dimensions of that? Eight by 11 or eight by 14. That's right, yeah. 8.5 by 14, okay. Don't know the formula for the diagonal and for the perimeter and the area? Google the formulas or text me and I'll send them to you because it's not a math class. And then of course you need to print the results. You don't have to get fancy and try to uh, encode all of this in uh, you know in functions and you know you, you can make it as complicated as you want, but we haven't learned a lot of complications here. One thing I need to tell you though is how to take the square root of something. If if your formula involves the square root of something, like a is equal to the square root of ten, if you need to do that. Just make it a equals 10 star star 0 0.5. That's how you can take the square root. It's a quick trick. I mean, a quick way of taking the square root. Star star 0 0.5 is a quick way of expressing the square root. And like I said, if you can't figure it out, I'll always give you the equations. Almost always. There may be some reason I'm not going to. Okay. That makes sense. Pretty easy assignment. You're just going to be calculating something. You're going to be calculating three values based on 8.5 and 11. You can also calculate the same three values for 8.5 by 14. I'll put a parenthetical. I think it would be awesome if you encoded, if you used variable names to store the height and width. area, parameter, and diagonal. I'm not going to count you off if you don't. I will say this though. If you just do this, print 8.5 plus 8.5 plus 11 plus 11, which happens to be the perimeter, That's not too cool. Why? Because the user doesn't know what that means. This would be better. Right? That would be way better. You should tell the user what they are seeing. I think I made a lecture e drop box. Let's confirm that. Yeah. Bring that back.